Ну, я не знаю, Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, I Yeah, mistakenly believe that technical writing is only for technology-centered fields or fields in architecture and engineering. While technical writing is commonly used in these fields, it is actually a style of writing that is not specific to any particular field. It's based on something called Puritan plain style, which is a type of writing where uncomplicated sentences and ordinary words are used to make simple, direct statements. This style was favored by the Puritans who wanted to express themselves clearly in accordance with their religious beliefs. In modern times, however, this style is often used in technology, architecture, and engineering fields, but it is also, co also common in business and many other disciplines. Keeping the definition of technical writing in mind, can you think of any examples in writing that use one of these purposes? You may want to pause the video to give yourself a little bit of time to think. Here are some examples of technical writing. Some other examples might include textbooks, lists of instructions, how-to tutorials, hiring resources, training manuals, job descriptions, offer letters, most web pages, and more. Did you think of any other examples? The next few slides will be some visual examples of what different types of technical writing might look like. This is a tutorial in a magazine showing how to drive a golf ball further. This one is a poster for how to use chopsticks. This example shows the articles of incorporation for a church. This is an instruction manual on how to use the office printer. This example is a humorous adaptation, but the concept still applies. This one is a medical pamphlet about cholesterol. A manual for using or putting together an appliance is also a technical writing example. This one is how to install a car part. And finally, this one is a research article about a math problem. All of these examples have been examples of technical writing. Notice that some of them are from technology fields, but others are not, such as the Articles of Incorporation for Church or a medical pamphlet about cholesterol. However, these are still examples of technical writing because they use that same Puritan plain style writing that favors direct, direct and simple statements over anything else. Before we discuss how technical writing is unique, Let's first talk about the similarities between technical writing and other types of writing. 
First, you still have to use some kind of writing process that includes brainstorming or pre-writing, drafting, revision, and editing. Though the process may look a bit different from other types of writing, it's still important that you do not simply turn in or publish writing that you have simply drafted with minimal effort. The writing will still take time and effort. Even though it may be shorter than other writing, it may actually take longer to know exactly what information is essential to include and what information is essential to leave out. Every word must count in technical writing. You still have to employ strong language skills, including correct grammar, punctuation, spelling, and more. We'll talk more about this later. You will likely need to heavily research the topic you're writing about, too. Like Einstein said, you can't explain it simply if you don't understand it well enough. You also don't want to accidentally provide the wrong information to your reader. And finally, just how your professors may ask you to use APA or another style, Technical writing requires a strong knowledge of its own guidelines and rules, and each individual field or company will have its own rules that must also be carefully used. You may be wondering why some of these similarities are still important. Here are a few examples of how just a simple punctuation mistake or ambiguity can completely change the meaning of the sentence. We don't want to eat grandma, we just want to tell grandma that it's time to eat. You may see these other examples as well. Without commas, if you say the panda eats shoots and leaves, you're talking about a panda bear who is eating shoots and leaves from a bamboo stalk. But if you add commas, you're actually talking about a, a panda who is not just eating bamboo, but is also shooting something and leaving the, the scene of the crime. Here is a sentence from a business document that has no commas. The sentence is the following. The initial workshop identified the work scopes and phasing generated several different sourcing strategies for those work scopes and proposed selection criteria to compare the sourcing strategies to best benefit the project. First, that's a really difficult sentence to read. It doesn't have any commas and we don't know where to pause. Let's look at some different examples of what um, the proper example may look like. The way the sentence is worded without punctuation, it probably means one of two things, but we can't be sure. Is it indicating that all the workshop did was identify work scopes while the phasing process did the rest? Or is it a list of the different items the workshop accomplished? The workshop identified the work scopes and phasing, it generated sourcing strategies, and it proposed selection criteria. Without the commas, we don't know, and the business document does not accomplish its intended purpose to inform. Remember this when you're writing your own technical writing examples. If you choose not to include commas, or you include them in the wrong places, you are likely to confuse your reader, which could have drastic consequences. Now that we have identified some of the ways that technical writing is similar to other writing styles, let's look at what makes it different. First, the audience, or readership, is usually much more specific than in other writing styles. In fact, the written material is often only written for one job title, and it may only ever be seen by those it's written for. For example, instructions for putting together a military airplane would only be useful for an aircraft engineer, but the plans would probably only even be accessible to those particular engineers working on the project. This is an extreme example, but the same is true for employee handbooks, professional lab reports, business proposals, contracts, and more. It's likely that only those involved in the project will even ever see the document. Next is presentation. The presentation or structure of technical writing documents is also unique in that it values simplicity and clarity over anything else. The famous phrase, writing flow, often gained through transitions in varied sentence structure, is not important or even effective in technical writing. Instead, short and precise language is valued. If you tend to keep your writing short and to the point, this style may be just right for you. Visuals. Unlike many other styles or genres, visuals are highly encouraged in technical writing. Pictures, drawings, or other graphics can help readers get an image in their head and ultimately better understand the directions or concepts being explained. Knowledge. Do you remember teachers in high school and college telling you that you had to prove your credibility by using the credibility from other sources? While that is important in academic research, especially as a student, 
In technical writing, you are automatically assumed to be an expert on the topic. If you try to prove your credibility, you will lose the trust and respect of your reader. On a similar note, teachers probably also used to tell you that you had to make the information interesting when you write. Perhaps for some writing assignments, you were asked to show emotion or give an opinion. For creative writing, you were probably even asked at times to be a bit ambiguous so that you could create suspense in your story. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'll welcome to the first edition of our continuous environmental education program. It's nice joining us. Happy New Year for everybody. Thank you for believing in a co environment talk. Like we promised last year, that apart from the talk, we felt capacity development and uh, career. Development also is one of the key focus of this organization. And we feel that colleagues, professionals should be developed in different aspects. That's why today we felt one of the key way in which professionals can make their work known is by writing a good report. How do you prove how do you convince, especially the politicians? How do you convince non-technical people, especially non-scientists? How do you communicate your information? That is why we are putting together this. Today we have in our means one of our senior director who will take us on technical report writing. Next week, we'll continue also with water quality monitoring. In two weeks time, we'll go into science of climate change. Then we'll now talk about the first edition of eco environment talk. So today generally, we want to talk about technical report writing and we will thank our elect, the guest lecturer, Dr. Sojinu, who is already online. The actual lecture will start by five o'clock and we urge all participants to mute their, their mic. We can use the chat box or the question and answer. Let's introduce ourselves, our organization. If you have any question, let's put it in the chat box so that we can make this worthwhile. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Let me invite Mr. Sojinu to kickstart the lecture. Thank you all.
if you have any question, you can send it as a question or you send it as a chat. All questions will be after the presentation. Thank you.
Hello. Hello. How do you, sir? We can hear you loud and clear, sir. Okay. Uh, good evening, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm sorry for joining late. I don't know the route that uh, Mr. Lassisi and his team had to take me through to get here. Um, I believe everybody can see my screen, Abby. Yes, Hello? sir, we can see your screen, but we prefer if you can make it in slide mode, sir. Okay. Is it okay this way? Yes, sir. it's okay, sir. Okay. Um, good evening once again. Um, my name is Sojuno Lasukomi Sewanu. Um, I will be taking us through this first series on a continuous capacity development program, the CDP. Uh, and I will be talking to us on technical report writing and presentation. Let me start by thanking the organizers of the CDP for inviting me to take this uh, first lecture. And I must thank everyone who is joining us at this particular time for this lecture. I will be taking us through, I think I am I'm told I have about 45 minutes thereabout. So I'll be taking us through how to prepare a report, and in particularly how to prepare a technical report, what should be, what should you, what should you think of when you are preparing a technical report or a report, so to say. And so that will be the focus of this discussion this evening. So let, let's, let's, let's just go ahead. The outline for my presentation is as seen on your screen, a brief introduction. We we'll look at the training objective, what do we intend to achieve from this training. Uh, we we'll look at the act of reporting. Uh, we we'll look at technical reports. We we'll look at report writing skills and we'll look at report, report presentation. Now, permit me to to first take you through what the training objective uh, for this evening are. Uh, number one is that we are hoping and we are believing that participants at this training will be able to present their reports clearly and effectively in a manner that will aid management decision making process this is uh, that participants will be able to target their audience in while writing reports. They will have their audience in mind and they will have the expectation of their audience in mind as they put the reports together. They will be able to structure their reports to maintain and to sustain the reader's attention. You know, there are, there are times where you pick a report or you pick a book. By the time you open the first page, you don't want to drop it. You just want to keep reading it and keep reading it because it makes an interesting read. And there are also times when you pick a report or you pick a document, by the time you flip through first two pages, you just drop it somewhere because it's just not flowing. It's not making sense, you know? So um, we expect that from now, participants will be able to make their reports in such a manner that it will retain the attention of the reader they will be able to write effective information analytical reports. Uh, as scientists, I don't know how many people are here who are scientists, but as scientists, we are expected to be able to pro, uh, re produce analytical reports, reports that uh, contain facts and figures, reports that can inform decision making. We hope that participants will be able to, you know, construct the arguments in such a persuasive manner that will help them achieve results. 
Now, let's quickly go to introduction. Well, uh, every organization uh, look forward to reports, reports either of events or of the activities of progress made, reports of investigations. Organizations depend on reports for decision making most times. That is why at the end of the year, you will see companies doing end of year report. They do their annual audit reports just to see their standing and their performance in the course of the year. As a matter of fact, for promotion in some organizations, reports have to be prepared on the officers. For those of you in, this, in the Lagos State Public Service, you know that uh, the SPADEF is a report on your performance you know, in the course of the year as you look forward to promotion. And so uh, reports are important. Uh, for decision making, they are important for providing information. They are important, you know, for educating the reader, and they are important, particularly for planning for the future. Because sometimes in planning for the future, you may need to scan through the reports of the past to see what has happened in the past, so you can know what to prepare for in the future. So reports are very important, and it's important that when we are preparing reports. We should have the, this in mind. Everybody, in fact, in homes we do we, we write reports. In homes we look at reports. When our children goes to school, go to school, and they are coming back at the end of the term, we ask for their uh, report because that is an account of their performance throughout the term. So reports are important in decision making. Now, uh, report writing uh, somehow. Everybody is expected to be able to write a report, but not everybody is good at writing reports. Everybody is expected to be able to put together a report, but experience has shown that it's not everybody that has the capacity to be able to produce a good report. And um, if you are going to be able to advance in your career, either as a, uh, as a middle level officer or junior officer, uh, you, you definitely have to write to a report because you, you still have superiors. For as long as you have superiors, they will expect from you to produce reports, either of activities or investigations or of uh, events. And so reports are things that you cannot run away from. As a matter of fact, some of us, when we joined the public service, some of the things we're exposed to is the is writing of minutes of meetings and converting them to reports of meetings. These are some of the things that help us, you know, to be able to develop some of the skills that we, are, we have today in preparing reports. So essentially, a report is a short, sharp, concise document, which is written for a particular purpose and audience. A report is a short, sharp, that is straight to the point, is concise, it's a concise document which is written for a particular purpose or audience. So when you are writing a report, you must have your audience in mind and you must know the purpose of the report. For instance, if you are writing a monitoring report, you will know that you are trying to provide information about the activities that you have carried out in terms of the monitoring. Then who is the audience? Who is going to read this report? So it's important that you have the, your audience in mind. If you are writing to someone who has no background at all in the field or on the subject matter that you are writing, you will need to be thorough enough and at least communicate the language that the fellow can understand. So your audience is important. Now, the Oxford English Dictionary defined a report as an account given on a particular matter, especially in the form of an official document after thorough investigation or consideration by an appointed person or body. It's an account that is given by somebody or by a group of persons on either an event or an occasion after investigation or consideration by, by that particular person. So if, for instance, we are asked to write the report of today's training, 
somebody is given that responsibility. So the person has the responsibility of writing the report on what transpired in the course of this training this evening. And so he's supposed to document the things that, that are critical or are germane that, trans, that, that, that have actually occurred in the course of the training as part of the report. So somebody is given a responsibility to document that kind of, uh, to put that report together. So that is a report. It is a systematic presentation of established facts about a specific event or subject. When you present facts and figures about an occurrence or a subject matter in a manner that is logical and makes a lot of sense, it is a report. And so it is a systematic presentation of established facts about an event or a subject matter. I have read a lot of reports in my life. I have come across reports that once you pick them, you just, you're just enjoying the story. I've also come across reports that once you read the first two lines, you, ju you just prefer to call the person who writes it and say, please come and tell me what you are talking about. Because the fellow could not present his facts in a logical, sensible manner. He, the report is not readable. There are several people who write reports that are not readable. They just pass it and that is all. And so it is a report is a, is a summary of findings and recommendations about a particular matter, an issue or a problem. And so when you, if you just put together your findings in such a manner that it will help who is reading it to relate with what you have, your findings and to be able to either agree or disagree with your recommendations. That, of course, is a report. So report writing is essential in every organization. It's essential for either organizational growth. It's essential for organizational activities. In fact, it's essential for development of even an individual himself or herself. What are the types of reports that you may come across? There are reports that are routine reports. Routine reports, these are reports that you prepare regularly or periodically. Yeah, you prepare them periodically or regularly to convey information about either progress being made or the status of work or activities that is being carried out. So it is a regular uh, report. We call them routine reports. Um, uh, routine reports usually come from day-to-day -day activities sometimes. For instance, you go out for inspection, you write your report, you already have a format in which you write it, and so you present the, the report. That is a routine report. These are reports that you come across or you come across on, uh, in your day-to-day -day activities. Example of such reports include progress report uh, about, about a project or an activity, minutes of meeting. Minutes of meeting, of course, should become routine for officers within the civil service because over time they will have to write that and write that again. In special reports, monitoring reports, these are routine reports. These are routine reports, reports that you see you know, from time to time. Performance appraiser, Spandem for instance, in legacy has become a routine thing. You know that at least you do it twice in a year. Uh, it has become uh, something you, you come across periodically. And then of course, periodic reports, either weekly, monthly, quarterly, or annually. Some of us in departments, we do write monthly departmental reports. And sometimes we write annual departmental reports. I know that some of us who goes out for either some activities, write either daily reports or weekly reports or monthly reports. These are reports that you write periodically and they fall under the category of routine reports. For those who work in, in industrial setting, particularly in the manufacturing setting where quality assurance is an issue. Quality assurance reports or quality control reports are routine reports that they must produce either on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis or even on a daily basis. And then you come across what we call the, what we call special reports. Now, special reports are actually prepared you know, for special situations or occasions. They are prepared when a special situation or problem arises. For instance, when you, we had the um, 
petroleum pipeline explosion at Abuleadu, a special report has to be prepared to capture what transpired there and the situation. This is not a routine report. This is not a report that you do from time to time. This is a report that you do because you are trying to address a special situation or a problem. So these are special reports. Now, it could, a special report could be the out, an outcome of a research work that is done or is a survey or an investigation that is carried out, you know, and uh, you could have example of special reports to include reports of investigations carried out, reports of investigation that is carried out. You, for instance, if you have, if you investigate an accident or investigate an incident, you can you do a special report. You call it investigation report, and that of course is special report. There are some technical reports that fall under special reports. These are not routine reports that you do on a daily basis. For instance, feasibility. Feasibility study report, the report of a feasibility study. Uh, maybe government want to government want to carry out a project, for instance, the state government, for instance, probably want to establish a waste to energy facility. And then they ask you to do a feasibility study to see how feasible that project is. So a feasibility, a feasibility study report is a technical report, which is under special report. The project report, report of, of the project is a special report. It's not a routine report that you get on a daily basis. Reports of a research carried out or a survey carried out is a special report. These are not reports that you do on a daily basis. So it is not a routine report. And then there are what we call formal reports. Formal reports could be either special or could be routine. But it's a, it's, it's a, it's a report that is presented, you know, in line with a prescribed or a standard format. You know, there's already an established procedure for such reporting. There's already an established format for it. So what you just do is to produce the report based on that format or that prescribed standard. And so that, that is, of course, a formal report. You know, these reports include reports that are submitted by, by either companies, you know, annually, it includes uh, statutory reports. There are several statutory reports that we receive in the public service as regulators, for instance, in the environment sector, we receive reports such like uh, audit reports, assessment reports, we receive uh, risk assessment reports, we receive uh, these this statutory reports. These are formal reports because they already have a prescribed format or a prescribed structure for presenting them. And then there are informal reports that you do not need to follow any prescribed form or procedure. These are informal reports and uh, they usually can be a person-to-person -person communication. It can be a person-to-person -person communication. It can even be in the form of a, a letter or a memo to that person. And so these are informal reports. Now, because I have been asked to talk about technical reports, I'm going to pay uh, some attention to technical reports, you know, so that we can we can uh, understand. Now, reports generally are made to do two or three things. Reports generally, whether they are technical or they are just normal reports. Number one, reports are meant to inform. And so they are meant to inform. Um, so reports could be informative. Uh, reports are meant to either convince or persuade. And so you talk about persuasive uh, reporting, where you are expecting the reader to be able to take some decisions. And so they are either meant to convince or persuade. Uh, they are meant to inform. And sometimes they are meant to resolve issues. Maybe you are supposed to go and investigate a matter and then put uh, be able to draw conclusions for government or for your company, your organization to be able to resolve what the issues are. So they can, they can be reports that are targeted at resolutions. They can be reports that are targeted at decision making. Reports that are targeted at decision making are either informative or persuasive reports in such a manner that they are able to convince whoever is the reader to be able to take the right decision. 
Now, so what is a technical report? A technical report is a formal report that is designed to convey technical information in a clear and easily accessible format. It is designed to convey technical information in a clear and easily accessible format. That is a technical report. It is, it's a formal report now, but it is designed to carry technical information. And so you are in the technical report, you are to provide some technical information that will help whoever is really to be able to understand and take decisions. And But it must be presented in a clear and easily accessible uh, manner. A technical report is meant to convey information in an objective, fact-based manner. So technical report must contain facts and figures. What that tells you clearly is that in writing a technical report, even if you must be able to do thorough research, even if you don't have knowledge of the subject matter that you are writing on, you are expected to have researched to, for you to be able to present your facts and figures. So technical reports are made to convey information in an objective and fact-based manner. Now, your style of writing technical reports must be in such a way that you relay your information to your reader in a clear and efficient fashion. The fellow who is reading your report may not have the technicalities that you have, may not even have the technical know-how that you have, but he must be able to read that technical report and be able to relate to what you are saying. Now, technical reports are usually well-structured reports that are prepared in line with established standards or requirements. Uh, I give an example, uh, transport impact assessment, drainage impact assessment, um, uh, risk assessment. You are looking at, you are looking at reports that must be structured in such a manner that they meet requirements. They meet standards. You are look, talking about environmental impact assessment. You are talking about assess, uh, audit as audit reports. You are talking about social impact assessment. These reports have, they, they are supposed to uh, convey some technical information in a manner that align with requirements. And so I've given examples before. You can see some of the examples below on the slide. These are examples of technical reports. And so let's move to the next slide. Now, before the report, before putting together a report, there are a few questions you will need to ask yourself and answer. And I know that going through a lot of reports in the course of my few years in the service, I've, I've come across people writing reports without ans asking these questions. They actually just write reports, follow what they have seen other people do, follow what they think is the standard that probably their superiors have set for them, and they just write. But when you are putting a report together, you must be able to answer these questions. Number one, who is going to read this report? Who am I writing to? Who is reading the report? Is the fellow a superior? Yes, if he's a superior, does he have the technical know-how? That brings me to the second question. What is the level of, the, of their current knowledge on the subject? The reader of this report, how knowledgeable is the fellow on this subject matter that I'm writing on? Does he or she knows his or her left, his or her right, you know, on this subject? So if I began to use some technical terms, can he or she relate with it? If I begin to talk about things like strategic environmental and social assessment, does he know what I'm talking about? If I'm talking about, if I'm using terms, does he actually know? If I say clean development mechanism, does he or she understand what I'm talking about? If he doesn't understand, then what can I do that so that my reader can relate with what I'm writing. Then the next question is, how much information do I need to put this report together? And that will help you to know the level of research that you're supposed to do. How much information is needed for me to be able to put this report together? 
That is, so you don't just jump into writing technical reports. You must have gathered the pieces and pieces of your reports together. Gather them together before you start writing. That is the first stage of preparing for writing a report. You must first acquire your information, acquire your data before you can effectively put together a report. Then you need to ask yourself, what background information do I need to include? Then why is this reader reading the report? Is it for information? Is it for decision making? Is, why is he reading it? If I'm writing a report and the commissioner, the report is addressed to the commissioner, why is the commissioner the one to read the report? What am I expecting him to do after reading this report? Because what I'm expecting him to do after reading this report will inform how I put the report together. Is it just for his information or is it for his action? So if I'm expecting him to take some action after reading the report, then I need to be able to put the report in such a manner that he will be able to take those actions. So these questions must precede our writing of reports. Now, what are the essentials? of a good report. What are the essentials of a good report? Number one, you must understand the intent and purpose of that report. What do I want to achieve by writing this report? They have asked me to write this report. What is the intention? What do they want to achieve? What is the report targeted at achieving? That brings me back to the same question that we asked before, in part of the question we asked before, this reader who is going to read this report, what are we expecting him to do after reading this report? Well, that is the purpose or that is the intent. That's the intention behind writing of the report. Nobody just writes report for writing's sake. We don't just write reports so that the files will be filled up. We don't just write reports so that we can have our cabinet filled up with jargons. We write reports either to inform our superiors or to, to ask them to take some steps or Take some actions. So, so you must have understanding of what you, you intend to achieve with that report. Number two, you must determine the scope of the report. How deep do I want this report to go? How wide? What is the coverage of this report? That will determine the, the level of information you are going to gather. What, how much of details do I intend to put in this report? That will help you in knowing how much of research or how much of information you, are, you need to get. If it's just a one-page report that you don't need to provide so, so, so much of details, you don't need to you know, spend the whole day looking for information up and down. Just provide basic information that will help the fellow who is reading it to take a decision. Then you need to plan your writing. People, a lot of people don't plan their writing. A lot of people don't plan their writing. You need to plan your writing. And in planning your writing, what do you need to do? You need to have to first acquire your information. Acquire the data you need. Acquire the information you require before you start writing. Don't just jump into writing a report without having gathered your information. When you gather your information together, it helps you to be able to put your report together effectively. So plan your writing. In planning your writing, you need to tell yourself, what style of writing am I going to be using? What style of writing am I adopting? Am I going to, is it, am I going to go persuasive? I want, do I want to really convince the readers that this matter must be addressed? Am I just going informative? Do I just want to educate them? What is my style of writing? And in planning my writing, it will help me to be able to determine what I want to achieve. Then I need to research the topic, collect information and data around the subject matter. For instance, you, you listen, uh, uh, colleagues, you don't have to know all things. You don't have to know everything. But you can actually know a bit about everything. And so if you are given a subject matter that you have no information about, no knowledge about, there is an international open school of knowledge on the internet. Go there and search. 
ask those people you think can have knowledge about the subject matter. Talk to people who probably have experiences in that field. Gather your information because it is in putting your information together that you will be able to achieve your goals. And then you must be able to arrange your information in a logical sequence. It is quite painful when you pick a report and you know the lines are not following. You read paragraph one and paragraph two, paragraph three, four, five, and you just see that your paragraph one, you know, is not it's not following flowing with with your, your paragraph two is not flowing with your paragraph one. It's not it's not flowing. And so when that is when that when when you don't when you are not able to present your information in a logical manner, it doesn't make a good read at all, and the fellow who is reading may lose interest. So you need to arrange your information in a logical manner, marshal your points in a logical sequence, let the points follow each other in a very well arranged sequence. That makes a good read. You will see that. When any time your report gets to your superior who is used to your writing, he pays attention because he knows that he's going to find something, he's going to find, have a good read of your story. Then structure your report. Particularly if you are preparing a report that's, that, that does not have an, an already established structure. Structure your report, determine the format of writing, and then of course, follow through with that format. Still talking about essentials of a good report. In reporting, avoid jargons. Avoid jargons. You are not impressing anybody by using jargons in your report. Speaking grammars or using very verbose uh, English that does not make any sense. Use very simple English. But don't erode the don't erode the essence of the writing. Use plain language, something that any, everybody can understand and relate with. Avoid jargons. Use technical terms only and when they are required to convey your information. Use technical terms when they are required to convey, you know, a meaning or a particular information. Don't try to intimidate anybody using jargons because nobody is actually intimidated. It will only make a mess of your report. Then package your report in such a manner that is readable. Make your report readable. I've said that before. In technical reports, visual aids are allowed. We are necessary. For instance, graphs. Sometimes graphs tells the story more than the text or you know the prose. Charts, charts can tell the story even better than prose. Diagrams, maps, imageries. These a visual aids can actually help to tell the story better than you probably would have you know said said it in your prose. Pictures, put pictures. Pictures don't lie, put pictures. And for a, part, for a report that you intend to actually, you intend to actually convince and persuade people to take a decision, sometimes you may, particularly for investigative reports, you may need to use pictures that have time, time stamp with date. It will show the date the picture was taken and time the picture was taken. That will prove that you are not just importing a picture from somewhere, that it is actually the picture of the event, you know, or the situation that you, that you have taken. This is important if you actually want to be able to prepare a good report. Edit and proofread your report. There are people who have read through their reports most times, and you see that this guy or this lady is just in a hurry to just drop this report. Don't be in a hurry to drop this report. Don't assume that your, your hand is writing exactly what your grade is saying. 
Because sometimes your hand will be faster or sometimes your brain will be faster. And so it is important that you ensure that you actually go through your write-up again. And if time permits, ask somebody else to help you go through it. Because sometimes, because you are the one who wrote it, you may assume that what you have, what you want to write is what you put there. And so it is it is important that you do proofreading, you know, you do editing of your report before you send it out. Why is this important? Because when your report gets to whoever is going to read it, you may not be sitting with the fellow to read. So the fellow is going to be reading the report. And sincerely, the report that you append your signature to speaks volume about you. Anything that is going to carry your signature gives an impression about your person. And so if you bring a report to me, for instance, and there are a lot of mistakes there, a lot of jargons there, it just gives me an impression that you are a serious fellow, uh, that this officer is not a serious person at all. How can you give me this kind of report? That is the impression that will be created in the mind of the reader of the report. And so don't be in such a hurry that you will not proofread or edit whatever you have written. Now, principles of clear writing. If you want to write a good report, there are some principles you need to adhere to. Number one, your reports must be objective and factual. They must be objective and factual. Don't insinuate in your report. Make sure you are presenting the facts. Don't assume in your reports. Make sure that whatever you are presenting, particularly if it is a technical report. And that person, please help us move. Don't kill the person, do. Help us move, please. So if your report must make sense and must not cast doubt in the mind of whoever is reading it, then it must be factual and objective. Number two, your report must obey the, C, the four C's principle. And the four C's principle says it should be clear, it should be concise, it should be correct, and it should be complete. Your report must be clear. Don't make your report ambiguous. Don't write a report that people will be wondering where you tend to. You are neither here nor there. You know, we can't place what you are saying. It's, it's so ambiguous that if, if the reader is wondering what exactly you are trying to communicate, I've come across such reports before. That where I will be saying to the, I will actually say to the fellow, you're not saying anything. I'm not hearing, I'm not seeing anything from what you have said. And so you must be able to clearly communicate. And then your report must be concise. Don't make it unnecessarily lengthy. There is no point having a verbose report that has no substance. You can actually do a report in two, three, four pages, and you will have it will have a lot of substance in it. Don't you are not impressing anyone by having voluminous reports if there's no need for it. And so let your report be concise and straight to the point. Your report must be correct. It is, it is actually a crime to write a misleading report. It is better not to have a report than to have a wrong report because a wrong report will produce a wrong decision. Because if your report is for the, the decision maker to make a decision, a wrong report will mislead them. Let's say, for instance, you, the company is looking at their annual performance last year for them to be able to plan for this year. And maybe they make a profit of 40 billion naira last year. And in your report, you wrote that they made a profit of 60 billion for whatever reason. Now, that report will mislead the management in their projection for this new year, because they were assuming that if they can make 16 billion last year, they should be able to make more this year. So they will have made projections based on misleading figures of 
or data. And so any data you are going to present in your report, any information you are presenting in your report must be go, must go through some background checks. Check the references, check the authors of that information before you put it in your report because it could be misleading. Then don't leave incomplete sentences in your report. The report must not be loose-ended. The report must be complete. The report must actually say something. The report must make recommendations and draw conclusions. The report must tell us where we should go and what we should do or what we shouldn't do. It must be complete. Don't leave, don't write a loose-ended report. It does not make any sense. Use only vocabularies that will help understanding of people who are reading the report. Write short sentences. Write short sentences. Avoid too lengthy sentences. Let your sentences be coherent. Coherent means let it be logical and consistent. Let your sentences be cohesive. Let them stick together tightly. Let it be cohesive. Write short paragraphs. Don't write too lengthy paragraphs. You can actually break the paragraphs into several paragraphs. I've seen paragraphs with people writing one paragraph with almost 15 lines, 20 lines in a paragraph. That is too lengthy a paragraph. That can actually be broken into two paragraphs. Let your ideas that you are communicating the report link. That's why I said it, you must arrange your ideas or your report in, in such a sequential manner, in such a logical manner that it will flow. So whoever is reading it can flow with what you are writing. This is very, very important. The four P's of a technical report. A technical report must first must seek to present the position of things as they are. What is the existing situation or status of the issue that the report is trying to address? Let's say, for instance, we have been asked to write a technical report or a report on the status of the Lagos Lagoon, the level of pollution in the Lagos Lagoon. Let's assume that is what we are asked to write on. The report must be able to present what is the present position or status of the Lagos Lagoon. And then the report must be able to tell us what is the problem with that situation. This is the status of the Lagos Lagoon. This is the problem with this status. If we allow this status to persist or we leave it like that. If we have a do nothing scenario, we, are, we don't do anything about the situation. These are the likely problems that will arise. And then the report must tell us what are the opportunities, the possibilities, the risk I say with, with the situation and the opportunities that we have. We have opportunities. What are these, you know, the, the prospects if we do something? And then the report must be able to propose what we should do. It must be able to tell us what are the recommendations, what we sh should be done, and how it should be done. It must tell us what should be done and how it should be done. Report presentation. Let's talk about presentation of, of a report. Now, I have said here that the content and format of presentation of a technical report depends on the type of report and what the report is meant to achieve. Not all reports don't have the same, they don't come in the same format. There is no cast, one cast in stone format for technical reports. The technical reports format or structure as of the content will depend largely on what the report seeks to achieve, on the type of report that it is. And so it is important that we know that. The reports, there are some reports that are 
that already have an established format in which they must be presented. And so such reports must be presented in such format. They must comply with the format or conform with the structure, both in content and in structure. For instance, if the reports, if the format says it should have table of content, have list of figures, have list of tables, have list of plates, it should have an executive summary, it should have a, a chapter one, chapter two, chapter three, chapter four, you must present this report in such a manner that it conforms with that structure and it must conform with the content in terms of what should be in the report. Now, technical reports with large volumes, you know, which you will require to bind, I expect to have executive summaries. Technical reports that will have large volumes, they are supposed to have executive summary. The reason is because chief executives of organizations do not have the time, they don't have the time to read those voluminous reports. For instance, you are taking a report of 150 pages to your MD. Ah, he doesn't have the time to go through 150 pages, but he will probably subscribe to reading about 10 pages that summarizes the entire 150 chapter, uh, pages of the entire report. And so what executive summary does is that it provides as chief executives you know, information about the content of the entire report, but in a summarized manner. So they still get the same, they may not get all the details, but they get information about the, the subject matter in a, in a summarized, concise manner. And so when you have a, when you are preparing a voluminous technical report, you know, it must have executive summary. And for research work, academic research work, it must have abstracts. We all know this. For research, academic research works, the abstracts of a research work is more or less like the executive summary of a technical report. Now, in some cases, technical reports may have appendices or annexures because there are certain materials you may not want to put in the main body of the report that you need to attach to the report as an, an annex or as, as an appendix. And so, for instance, maybe you have drawings, schematic drawings, you have uh, structural drawings, you have designs, 3D designs that you cannot put in the main report, you can attach them as an appendix. You have reports of a laboratory analysis that you cannot put in the report. You know, you can attach them as an annexure or an appendix to the report. So sometimes technical reports may have appendices or annexures, you know, to, to, the, to the main report. Now, let's talk about report originality and plagiarism. Report originality and plagiarism. Now, what is plagiarism? Plagiarism is actually a crime. It's an intellectual crime where you actually use somebody's facts or use somebody's ideas or use somebody's material without acknowledging or referencing the fellow. It is a crime. It is an intellectual property crime. It is called plagiarism. And so, Whenever you make use of other people's facts or ideas, you must reference them. If you are the not, if you are not the one that originates that data or that facts, you must reference the fellow. Even if it is in a one-page report that you use such facts, you must reference it because that facts and figure did not emanate from you. Any phrase. Any sentence or paragraph that you copied, you copied it on altar. You didn't change anything. You copied it from another material, another source. You must put it in quote. It must be enclosed with quotes. You must quote it and reference it. You can reference it by going by the num numbering system. So it shows. It shows that it is not from you, but that you took that, that particular material from somewhere. Any material that you did not reproduce unaltered should not be in quotes. If you, 
if you have, if you use my sentence, for instance, and you change it in your own way, you don't need to quote it. But you must reference because you have altered a sentence, but it is, does not originate from you. You still have to reference it. Now, information that is not referenced is assumed to either be something that is of a common knowledge or it is your own work or your own idea. If you do not reference it, we assume that it is coming from you or something that is a common knowledge. But if it is not of common knowledge and it is not coming from you, and you still do not reference it, then it is called plagiarism. You, are pla you, you, have, you have plagiarized that particular uh, material and you have committed an intellectual property crime. What are the minimum expectations, you know, that is expected in a in a technical report? Ah, time. Let me. I will be ending with this. Number one. Every report is supposed to have a title. It is supposed to have a title. Every report is supposed to have a title, and. The title must indicate the subject matter. It must indicate the subject matter that the report seeks to address. For instance, I'm, if I'm doing a report on um, a study on the Lagos Lagoon, I should be able to put it there, like e.g. assessment of the pollution load of the Lagos Lagoon. That is a title. So it must have a title. Now, if you are doing a, a memo or a submission to your superior on a technical issue, that is more or less like a report also. It must have an addressee who you are addressing it to. For instance, MD, GM, Chief uh, Director of Finance and Admin, it must have an addressee, and then immediately after the addressee must come the title or the subject matter. So you put the title there, which is it, it, it gives us clearly an idea of what you intend to address. Now, if it is reports that will require to be binded, there are voluminous reports, like I talked about before, such reports will require plenary pages. It will require a table of content, list of tables, list of plates, list of plates. Plates are pictures. We refer to them as plates in technical reports. List of plates, list of figures. Figures are like maps, charts, histograms, and all the rest. You could have list of acronyms and abbreviations if you actually use acronyms. Like PHCN is an acronym. So you need to, you need to explain what PHCN is in the list of acronyms. And probably it must have an acknowledgement you know, page where you acknowledge the sources of information or the supports that you have gotten because of putting the reports together. This is for reports that are of large volume that probably you want to buy it and put together for someone to read. And such reports must also have executive summary like I've explained earlier on. Now these are for reports with large volume. And so, but for reports that are not for large volume, once you have done the needful by having your addressee and you have the title, the next thing will be introduction. The introduction paragraph for maybe the short reports must provide some background information about the subject matter. And if, for instance, the report is as a result of a directive, you know, a directive received, you must make reference to such directive. And so you must provide in, in the introductory paragraph background information about the subject matter, about the issue that you are trying to address in the report. And if it is in the large report, the, you, you, the, the chapter of introduction provides background information about the subject matter. And in the body of the report itself, you must be able to provide your facts and figures. This is where you analyze the issues. 
<laughs> Excuse me. This is where you analyze the issues. This is where you present the facts. This is where you present the scenarios. This is where you present the arguments in the body of the report. This is where you present the arguments in the body of the report. And so for voluminous reports, it could be, this body of reports could be in chapters, depending on the format in which it is it's supposed to be presented. And then after the body, the main body of the report, as you are trying to conclude the main body of the report, you must be able to draw inferences and conclusions. Fact-based conclusions, not conclusions that are based on assumptions. The world that we are in is move, has moved from what we think to what we know. Decisions are no longer taken by what we think. Decisions are now being taken about what we know. People have moved from assumptions to evidence-based decision-making, fact-based decision-making. And so if you are going to convince or persuade anybody who's reading your report, you must be able to present your facts and draw conclusions. And then you must be able to recommend what to be done, recommendations or proposals as to what should be done. This is very important. It makes no sense to have a report that has no recommendations as to what to be done, and you call it a technical report. It, has, it makes no sense. And so the essence of a technical report really is to, is to provide technical information that either is meant for just to inform, inform the reader or to persuade the reader to take some decisions. These are basically some of the uh, considerations you need to look at for in putting together a report. I just want to say thank you for your time and I'll be open to take your questions as they may arise. Mr. Lassisi, I would like to hand over to you now. You have the floor. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir, for, for the presentation. We actually, I, I would say it was in-depth and we really enjoyed it. The floor is now open for anybody that asks one or two questions or clarification to, you can just unmute yourself and ask your question. Thank you. And I, should I stop sharing the slide? Yeah, you can stop there, sir. You can stop since the presentation is over. Okay. Hello, good evening, everyone. Hello. Good evening, good evening Mark. Good evening. This is Balaji Padra on the, on the call. Please, uh, I want to ask a question. You see, when we let's say like we like wrote a report on on uh, on an event, and maybe to be presented to the permanent secretary, and we are further asked to write an highlight on that same on that same report. The, um, at times I feel, what is the essence of the highlight? Because the highlight will not give you the details of what it is. Is it that it's on every uh, report that one must write an highlight? What's the essence of making it brief when you can go through what everything is all about? Please, I want a clarification on that. Okay, thank you very much, Ma. Um, well, it depends on the style of the superior. 
there are some superiors that want to know the details. Who wants you to give them all that they should know about an event, for instance? But there are some of, of our superiors too who are not patient enough to go through all of those details. And they just want something short, something brief that they can quickly scan through and understand what has happened. So it depends on the superior really. Now, why do we have to, is it so, is it so important? Um, well, it's, it's, it's not, a, I think it's the style of, of the individual uh, superiors who are asking us for such, for such. But like I said before, highlights are just like executive summaries in the voluminous reports now, you know, that just help you to, that just help you to, to understand what, what is, what the report is all about without having to go through the entire report. Maybe for instance, you write a report that's about three, four pages and uh, the, the boss is not, doesn't have the time to read two, three, four pages. He just wants a one page highlight. I think it's just for them, it's just a way of asking you to summarize it for them. And I think, like you said, uh, it's, it's just the style of an individual uh, or a superior officer. That's all I can say for now. It is not a... <laughs> Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you. Hello, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, if I may just add a little. Sometimes uh, some organization or some superior wants highlights of events or highlights of reports because they are also reporting to others. Okay. Imagine if I yeah. have to attend a, a program out of the States, let's say three days program, and my superior will report to the Honorable Commissioner or make a report to HE. You don't expect him to go through your three days activity that include excursion, practical work, so sometimes after the report, they may want to see the highlights. Okay, the conference, at the beginning of the conference, the minister gave this, the, the bulletin or the key things the, the minister delivered. Technical papers were presented. This, I, I think that is why highlights are now coming in into, into reports. They just want like five bullets or 10 bullets of what are the key things that really happen at, at the event or at the core of the reports. That, to me, I think that's why highlights are, are coming in. Sometimes it, it, it's now new in technical report writing or in report writing when people now talk, okay, yes, you have this, but what are the key highlights? If I want to make a report on it, I, I will be able to deal with that highlight. I think that's, that's why highlights are now coming into it. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Assisi. Yeah, I, I think I agree with you. I agree with you to that, to, you know, because they also probably want to also brief their own superiors too. I think that's, 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 good. that's correct. Sir. Hello, sir. I'm with you, sir. I'm with you. Yeah. That's a question. If an individual opinion is different from the opinion, like you, you have a report, like sometimes a joint report, uh, a committee was set up to uh, do an investigation, three or four months, and each of them have different opinion, how would they conclude the report? Because we, we find this, <laughs> Very, very, very common. This who want to impose his own opinion. This, and we have to submit one report. Sometimes we find out that people now write different reports. Yes, I, I want my my report to be in this. I want my. 
how how can you solve that, sir? Wow. Um, well, um, I think the first thing is to, to say that they are expected to work as a committee and then uh, they must work as one. They must work as a committee. If they are having dissenting voices as a committee, what is expected of them is to sit down and disagree to agree on the areas where they may be having issues. That is what is expected. It is not expected that a committee, a five member or a 10 member committee will actually speak with one voice or sleep on the same side of the bed, but they are expected to discuss, engage each other, and of course, uh, resolve areas of disagreement before they put together their report. It is expected that before a committee submit a report, they should agree on what they are presenting as a report. That is, if they are supposed to submit the report as a committee, they must agree on what they are submitting as a report. Since they are submitting one single report uh, as or based on the work of the committee, that's one. However, if it is the issue of majority carry the vote, where okay, um, we are we are a seven member committee, and uh, five people agree on this matter that it should be like this, and the two of us we have dissenting opinion about it. The committee will still write the report based on what the five other people have, have agreed on because they, they, they probably are the ones who are more. But what is expected of them is that they should carry along the other two people to see reasons or see reasons with the other two people why the issue should not be so. Now, if the report is now submitted and these other two people feel strongly that the report submitted will be misleading the state government. They have a moral duty to present their own report based on the facts and figures available to them. If the committee, for any reason, did not want to agree with them, if there are other issues that made the committee not to agree with them, but naturally a committee uh, is expected to disagree and agree on issues before presenting report. One should not be expecting a committee to be presenting, dissecting uh, two different reports. They should resolve what, or what differences there are based on whatever facts and figures at their disposal before they present their report. If we have a situation whereby they present the report and one person still feels that the issues are addressed in a manner that they do not, that doesn't carry along the interest of the body is representing. He will still take the report and will still write his own addendum to say, well, this is the, this is the resolution of the, of the committee, but these are my personal positions I expressed based on my experiences, but they are not taken because it's just only one man's expression. He can do that if he needs to safeguard anything that will affect his, his organization. That's important too. I don't know if I answer your question at all. Yeah, th thank you very much, sir. Uh, I think with that, we have come to the end of the first edition. Next week, Sunday, we'll be having Dr. Sanut with us, and it will take us on water quality monitoring, key aspects of water quality monitoring. Uh, and we know Lagos is surrounded by water, and we feel Monitoring our water bodies is very, very important. And in Lagos State, we have a lot of agencies, both federal and state, that has ministerial responsibility in terms of water monitoring. We also have institutions who are carrying out research on water monitoring. So we, we feel it would be very good if we can update our knowledge about water monitoring. On behalf of the team of Eco Environment Talk, we want to thank all the participants, especially want to thank our guest lecturer, 
thank you very much for having the opportunity to share in the wealth of your knowledge with us. Thank you very much. Sir. Welcome. Thank you for, for everybody. Me. For everybody, thank you all. We'll see you next Sunday. Thank you. Bye. Bye. The presentation will be available via mail. And okay. the, the recordings are also available on the YouTube channel if you want to listen once again. Okay, thank you.